Hey guys, Sulkar is here and welcome back to another episode of Messing Around with Sulk. In this episode, we are going to talk a bit about some D&D 5e spells. Namely, these three. Weird, Tetzer's Transformation, a True Strike. I'm going to talk about them in this order because I've ordered these tabs here and in, in order of less weird to more weird. And here's what I mean. These spells are weak. Yeah, they are kind of bad. But that's not why I'm talking about, talking about them. These spells are more weird than anything else. Yeah, fitting that one of them is actually called weird. But it's true though. Like when I read these spells, it makes me ask why? Why did they write the spell? Why did they design the spell this way? It just does not make sense to me. Also, for context, I don't have much experience with tabletop video, tabletop RPGs outside of D&D 5e. I have a lot of experience on D&D 5e. And that's the perspective I'm going to talk about, in which I'm going to talk about these spells. I know these spells came from earlier editions, but I don't know how they worked in earlier editions. So yeah. And... And let's just get to it because we have some stuff to talk about. If you've seen the video I posted right before this one, I already said that I wanted to make this video talking about a few spells. And as you can see, I found the three spells I wanted to talk about. There are probably more spells that are equally weird and, and mind boggling in their design. But I want to talk about these three. Starting off with weird, which is ironically the least weird of these three spells, in my opinion anyway. I am also going to assume you have some basic knowledge of how D&D 5e works. I'm not going to explain stuff like that. I'm just acting off the assumption that you know how stuff works. So it is a ninth level spell, which means it is supposed to be one of the most obscenely powerful spells in the game. Night level spells are late game spells and all of them are really, really powerful. Not overpowered, I won't, I won't call them overpowered because at that level you'd have so many different powers and spells that even things as powerful as night level spells aren't, aren't overpowered. They are powerful but not overpowered. So anyway, let's see what this spell does. It requires an action to cast. It has a range of 120 feet and an AOE of a 30 foot sphere. And it has verbal and somatic components, does psychic damage, and has a duration of one minute with concentration. Let's see, let's read. Drawing on the deepest fears of a group of creatures, you create illusionary creatures in their minds, visible only to them. Each creature in a 30 foot sphere centered on a point of your choice within range, must make a wisdom saving throw. On a fail save, a creature becomes frightened for the duration. The illusion calls on the creature's deepest fears, manifesting its worst nightmares as an implacable threat. At the end of each of the frightened creature's turns, it must succeed on a wisdom saving throw or take 4 detailed psychic damage. On a successful save, the spell ends for that creature. Now, this makes it makes the spell sound really cool and really frightening. Like from a narrative perspective, this spell is really is something to behold. But let's strip away the fluff and flavor for a sec and just look at the raw mechanics. What does this spell actually do in terms of a hard, hard observable, measurable effects? It, it targets up to four creatures who must make a wisdom save. If they succeed the save, the you just wasted a ninth level spell slot. Your most powerful spell wasted. And just like that. So this spell does nothing if they succeed. Lots of spells are, are like that. So that's not inherently an issue, but still a point against it, I guess. 
Because if you're spending a ninth level spell slot for something that might not even do what it's supposed to do, you really, really want and that spell to be like uber strong to compensate. But anyway, the creature becomes frightened. What does frightened do? A frightened creature has disadvantage on ability checks and attack rolls while the source of its fear is within line of sight. The creature can willingly move closer to the source of its fear. Okay. And then and you have this. The illusion blah 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 frightened and it does 4 detached psychic damage at the end of each of the creature's turns. Also at the end of each of the creature's turns the creature has a chance to break free from the spell by repeating the saving throw. So this spell has a good amount of chance of not doing any damage. A good amount of chance of not doing... Well, I won't say good amount of chance. It has a chance of not doing anything. And it has a chance of frightening a bunch of people for uh, one round at the least. So... Yeah, this spell really, really sucks. 4 detached psychic damage is good damage, but nowhere near as 9th level spell damage. There's another spell called Psychic Scream, which stuns creatures, is not concentration, stuns creatures indefinitely, mind you, un until they can succeed the intelligence saving throw. Yeah, it also targets intelligence. Wisdom is a more common saving throw to have. Intelligence is not... Uh, the other spell, Psychic Scream, let me just pull it up real quick. Psychic Scream. I put an extra C. Physic. I have been... For, I think I was possessed by the spirit of the guy who wrote <laughs> Life goes on the visual novel because I I misspelled psychic so bad right there. I misspelled psychic as bad as they spelled it in their game. Oh it comes full circle. I did not think it would come full circle like this in the middle of a completely unrelated video. Multiple years down the line, but here we are. Psychic Dream. This is the right spelling, I'm sure. <laughs> that, that was... That was poetic. That was almost poetic. So anyway, night level spell, also one action. Lower range and instantaneous. You unleash a part of your mind and to blast the intellect of up to 10 creatures of your choice that you can see within range. Creatures that have an intelligence of 2 or lower are unaffected, okay? Also component is Scream, so... No wait, the component is S, Somatic. You don't have to make verbal components, huh? That's interesting, I did not realize that. Each target creature must make an intelligence saving throw. On a fail save, the target takes 14d6 psychic damage and is stunned, i.e. they can't do anything. On a successful save, the target takes half as much damage and is at stun. If a target is killed by this damage, its head explodes, assuming it has one. A target, a stun target can make an intelligent saving throw at the end of each of its turns. On a successful save, the stunning effect ends. This is a really powerful spell. Compare that to weird, which does nothing. Well, it does things. That was too harsh, but it's not ninth level levels of power but there is let's dig a bit deeper because so far it just seems like this is a very bad ninth level spell but that's all it is a bad ninth level spell but the rabbit hole goes deeper and first of all here's where the weirdness starts it says that it creates illusionary creatures in the minds of the targets. I know this is fluff, but bear with me, I'm going somewhere with this. And it is, and that target over here it says, 
the illusion calls of the creatures deepest fears manifesting its worst nightmare as an an implacable threat an implacable threat is basically an unrelenting threat so they feel a sense of doom an uncanny sense of doom um, and panic the, like their worst nightmares are coming through and it's not stopping this is basically a uh, giving them an anxiety attack on steroids Th this is what this spell is doing but again that is flavor now here's the interesting part it says the creature becomes frightened the creature can't willingly move closer to the source of its fear here's the first thing the creature is frightened but it's not frightened of you the caster the creature is obviously frightened because you're making it live through its nightmares but what does that mean for this second point the creature can willingly move closer to the source of its fear you don't place illusionary tokens on the battle map or you don't create illusionary things in a certain direction in a mechanical sense so what actually does this mean can the creature move toward you like frightened is not mind control and i am disadvantaged on my like think about it like this let's say i'm playing a barbarian character right low intelligence uh, low wisdom a high level barbarian character i am hit with this spell because the enemy mage used it or the enemy lich used it on me my barbarian is frightened now because he is exper experiencing his worst fears manifesting all around him and and it doesn't even say where it's manifested it says you create illusionary creatures in their mind visible only to them it doesn't say you choose where those creatures are it doesn't say that and over here it also says it calls out the deepest fears manifesting its worst nightmares as an implacable threat and so is it creating a creature or not this is just weird am i reading this spell wrong am i just not understanding it am i missing something very simple i i just don't know what this spell wants me to do here and again going back to the raw the again this part the worst part is everything this spell has blended the mechanics and the fluff in such a way as written such a way that it's kind of hard to determine what is supposed to be taken as just fluff and flavor and what is the actual mechanics like like i've read a lot of spells and from my understanding it seems like this is the mechanics part of the spell but then we we'll run into a problem with frightened if the creature is frightened but there is no source of fear anywhere but it's also seen and it's again within line of sight well a lot of the the frightened condition depends deeply on having a source of fear that you can place somewhere but the spell doesn't talk about that at all do i create like if the spell instead of saying in shit like this if the spell said hey you choose a point you can see okay and and make the target creature or target creatures see that or any other points as the source of their fears something like that that you manifest illusionary source an illusionary manifestation of their nightmares at a point you can see and that is only visible to them if they worded it something like that i could understand but again the frightened condition depends so much on on the what the creature is frightened of they are not frightened of you the creature becomes frightened it doesn't become frightened of you what is it frightened of where is that source of fear because does it have disadvantage or not yeah obviously it does but that can it move closer to me or not this spell is weird like yeah you can 
obviously as a dm i know how to interpret it i would interpret it in, in a specific way but unlike every other spell that i know of this whole entire spell is up to interpretation up to dm interpretation because outside of taking psychic damage every time what the frightened condition is actually doing in the context of this spell is really up in the air and really depends on how the dm interprets this fluff part of the spell interprets this part of the spell here this and this so yeah this is the only spell i know that works like this where the solid mechanics the strict mechanics of the spell is really up to interpretation there is no clear answer in the spell description itself on what the frightened condition is doing in this spell obviously the creature is frightened but how is it working where is the light where is the source of their fear and now a dm can just there are many ways to do this here's how i would do it I would make it so that uh, the frightened creature sees every single spot around them as the source of their fear, e effectively reducing their movement speed to zero. Not stunned exactly, but reducing their movement speed to zero. They can't dash, they can dodge though, they can take the dodge action. And, but at the same time, that also means they can still attack. Like this will will harm melee hey, characters the most but ranged characters could still attack you the guy who cast this spell and again if you don't want to interpret it that way that is also fine because the spell has no clear indication of how you're supposed to take it can the like if my, i'm like i was saying if my barbarian gets afflicted by the spell can i just run up to the spellcaster reckless attack to get rid of disadvantage on my attack rolls and then just bonk him so hard that he loses concentration of the spell can i just do that this spell is weird like it seems like this spell doesn't even know what it's supposed to be doing So yeah, I think I think it would have been better if this spell worked more like how fan, Psychic Scream works where it's just they are stunned or maybe they are instead of frightened. I think how, here's how I would rewrite this spell. Not fear. Drawing on the deepest yes, desires, emotions and fears of target creatures you can see within range you trap them in a never-ending illusion of dreams and nightmares each creature within 30 foot radius sphere centered on a point of your choice within range must make a wisdom saving throw on a fail save that creature became uh, becomes frightened and charmed for the duration while the creature uh, is charmed and frightened this way and they take 4d10 psychic damage at the end of each of their turns and at the end of each of their turns they can repeat the saving throw to become free while also while charmed or frightened this way the creature may not take any actions reactions or bonus actions and they cannot move basically if you've seen that episode of the justice league where some villain Place this weird parasite things on Batman and Superman, make giving them everything they ever wanted and basically paralyzing them. That is how I would interpret this spell. The 4d10 psychic damage could be slowly draining the life of them or something. I don't know. It's a ninth level spell. It needs to be powerful, but that's how I would rewrite the spell. It's not balanced yet because I did not balance check it. This is something I just suggested off the top of my head. But as a written, I think if my players ever get to a point where either I am going to use this spell against them 
or they are going to use it against monsters I throw at them. I'm going to stop and have a discussion with them on how they think the spell should work. Because it's not clear at all. And this is why I chose to talk about this spell. It's not that this spell is weak. It is weak. But how exactly the frightened condition is working for this spell is just weird. Most other effects that cause the frightened condition and actually places a thing for that creature to be frightened of. And th this isn't the only weird spell that does it. Hey, pun intended. That is something else I want you to see. Another spell, a fourth level one called Phantasmal Killer. You tap into the nightmares of a creature you can see within range and create an illusionary manifestation of its deepest fears visible only to the creature. The target makes a wisdom saving throw. On a fail save, the target becomes frightened for the duration. At the end of each of the target's turns before this spell ends, the target must succeed on a wisdom saving throw or, ten, or take 4d10 psychic damage. On a successful save, this spell ends. Weird is just mass phantasmal killer. That's it. That is what this spell is. Weird phantasmal killer. And the name of this spell actually gives us kind of a clue on how maybe this spell is supposed to work. Maybe you place, like they see that another creature is attacking them or something. And that is what they are frightened of. But again, it's not strictly stated. I'm just inter I'm just, just assuming. And I guess what's the word? I forgot the word for it. Um inferring, yeah. I'm just inferring how that works based on we are actually being mass phantasmal killer. But also, there's one more thing I want to talk about this spell. Apparently, in earlier editions of d and I'm not sure which, this spell just straight up kill you. Save or die, bitch. Literally. Phantasmal Killer did the same thing. So, yikes. And this is what this spell has been reduced down to in 5e. Yeah, I don't know. This spell is just weird, fitting for what it's named. And now we go to the next weird spell, Tetzer's Transformation. And unlike weird, the spell, this one and it does not have a big rabbit hole to go down. Let's see what it does. Six level spell, causes an, costs an action, requires concentration, range is self, verbal, somatic, and material components. Duration is 10 minutes. And this is what it does. You endow yourself with endurance and martial prowess fueled by magic. Until the spell ends, you, can, you can't cast spells and you gain the following benefits. You gain 50 temporary hit points. If any of these remain when the spell ends, they are lost. You have advantage on attack rolls that you make with simple and martial weapons. When you hit a target with a weapon attack, that target takes an extra 2d12 force damage. You have proficiency with all armor, shields, simple weapons, and martial weapons. You have proficiency in strength and, say, strength and constitution saving throws. You can attack twice instead of once. When you take the attack action on your turn, you ignore this benefit. If you already have a feature like extra attack, that gives you extra attacks. Okay? You ignore this benefit if you have if you already have a feature that gives you extra attacks, like extra attacks. So, yeah. Immediately after this spell ends, you must succeed on a DC 50 constitution saving throw or suffer one level of exhaustion. This spell is really fucking cool. And the effect it gives is also really fucking good. So what's the problem? It's available for wizards. 
This spell is a wizard exclusive. Let me tell you why that's an issue. Let me take you on a short journey. Open the player's handbook. Go to the weapons, armor and shield section. Donning and doffing armor. The time it takes to don or doff a type of armor or a shield is shown in the donning and doffing armor table. Light armor. One minute. Medium armor. Five minutes. Heavy armor. Ten minutes. Shield. Okay, shield. One action. Fair. But remember, each round in D&D &D, last six seconds. One minute is 10 turns of combat. Wizard, the only class that can cast the spell naturally without some kind of trickery to get the spell somehow. Oh, would you look at that? No armor proficiency. This line right here is a nothing line. This does nothing. Because let me tell you something. Assuming you're not multiclassing, I'll get to what happens, why I'm assuming that. I'll get to why multiclassing also makes this useless. That's later. But assuming you're not multiclassing and you played a wizard all the way to 6th level. So all the way to 11th level, 11th character level, got this spell. You will not be wearing any armor when you cast this spell. It lasts 10 minutes, so it's not like you can cast this spell and just go into a dungeon or something. Oh look, it lasts 10 minutes. Did you remember the donning and doffing part again? Go back real quick. Heavy armor, 10 minutes. Medium armor, 5 minutes. If you cast this spell and try to like, let's say you cast this spell before a big boss fight and put on heavy armor. Congratulations, you played yourself. Because by the time you finish donning heavy armor, uh, you ran out of the spell. You don't, you the spell ran out of time. By the time you cast this spell and wear heavy armor. If you try to cast it in combat, you can't because Every armor takes multiple rounds. You can cast this before a boss door and hope the boss waits patiently for five minutes for you to don medium armor. But that's not going to happen. That's not going to be a thing that happens. Essentially, yeah, you have proficiency, big whoop. You can't use it. You're still going to be fighting unarmored. And this is concentration. If you fight unarmored in melee range, you will get hit, you will lose concentration, and you will be borked. You will get borked if you use the spell and fight in melee range as a wizard. Unless you specifically build your wizard for it. And speaking of building wizards for it, what would happen if you multiclass it to fighter to get it to get that heavy armor war mage, which is a very powerful character build, by the way. Putting heavy armor on a wizard is a really good idea. If you can start off as a level one fighter and then multi-class into wizard, that is really good because that wizard has saving throws in constitution, which means they are, their spells are going to be really hard
to get rid of with concentration checks. They are not going to fail concentration checks easily. So if you do that, but if you do that, look over here. You have profi You already have proficiency in strength and constitution. Okay, maybe you don't want heavy armor. Maybe you want medium armor or something. Or maybe you multiclassed it to life cleric or some shit to get heavy armor. Or you took a feat. Okay, that's fair. You have advantage of this and and because you have uh, proficiency in strength and constitution, you won't lose this spell from concentration damage. And you might still get borked in other ways, but it's not actually as bad as I was making out to be five minutes ago. I just realized that. So never mind that one. But even so, you're still going to fight an unarmored. You are going to get hit if you fight unarmored. And if you're fighting arm armored, this spell does not give you higher armor because you would already be wearing armor. Same thing over here. All shields, simple martial weapons. If you multiclassed to get armor, you already have proficiency in these weapons. You don't need this spell to give you proficiency. Only assuming that you were a single class wizard. Does this line make sense? Does the, not make sense? Does this line do anything? So this this line only affects thanks non multiclassed wizards. This line does nothing. What does that leave us with? Fifty temp HP, pretty good. Extra attack, pretty good. Pretty good, really good. The two D twelve force damage on every hit. Also, you can cast spells. This spell is really clunky. Let's get it out of the way. This spell is really clunky. Oh, wait. There's more. Or I forgot the most biggest damning part of this thing. Unless you play a very specific subclass called the Blade Singer Wizard, which, hold on. I need to confirm this real quick. Oh, would you look at that? Even if you're a blade singer, you still need to be wearing light armor at the very least. So, yeah. You gain the following benefits. Okay. Speed. Never mind. I was wrong. Here's the thing, a wizard does not usually fight with weapons, right? Like, I say usually, a wizard's main stats are usually hey, intelligence, of course, and then it's a two-way split between dexterity and constitution. Constitution, because, again, you want HP, you don't want your character to die, and dexterity because you need it for your AC. Here's where things get weird. And if you cast the spell to make weapon attacks, you would need to use your strength or your dex to make those weapon attacks. And if you're investing heavily into dex, that means you don't have that high of a constitution, do you? That means you will, will get hit a lot and potentially die if you cast the spell and try to be a melee wizard. Of course, you can always be a ranged archer wizard. That works. That works really well, actually. So that's not, again, not that big of an issue. But the problem with this spell is that its features seem to be fighting itself. And if you're a blade singing wizard, then like you already have good decks, good weapon stuff. If you're a blade singer, 
then this spell spell kind of works weirdly i guess because for you then again the armor proficiency staff is useless also you can't cast spells you're going to have to use a bow you lose your access to magic while this spell is up so this spell makes you turns your wizard into a fighter but your stats are still like that of a wizard because you have to go up to 11th level 11 levels of wizard to cast this spell you're going to have worse constitution than a fighter potentially worse dex than a fighter because you spent all of your stat points on intelligence well most of your stat points are intelligence you're not going to have 20 dex 20 intelligence you're just not so you're actually going to be hitting less often even if you pick up a bow you're going to be hitting less often with this spell and this is all for wizards again this is a wizard exclusive spell and you can't really even you can't really even and multi-class into it or use like i don't know some of the classes that draws from the wizard spell list like eldritch knight because this is such a high level spell this is a sixth level spell only full casters and warlocks have access to sixth level spell in the spells in dnd 5e half casters like paladins and rangers stop at fifth level in terms of spell slots one fourth casters stop at fourth level in terms of spell slots sorry one third casters and the final reason why i decided to talk about this spell why i say it is weird is because this is an amazing spell for everyone besides the wizard because one more thing if you try to cast it as a wizard it has a one action casting time so combat starts you give up your first turn casting this spell and then starting from the next turn onward and by the way because this is concentration you give your enemy a chance to just hit you right then and there with their weapons or their spells or their magic missile and make you lose concentration number one number two uh, if you manage to hold on to concentration for the first entire round of combat you are going to be hitting less accurately with your weapons because you're going to be using decks, not your intelligence like you would have if you attack with cantrips. So it just turns you into a worse fighter. It makes you skip your turn and then turns you into a worse fighter. But let me show you something. Sorcerer. Sorcerers are charisma casters they are probably likely to have higher constitution just generally just because they start with this or whatever but that's not the important part the important part is meta magic sorcerers can alter the properties of a spell using sorcery points we are going to look at quickened spell when you cast a spell that has the casting time of one action, you can spend two sorcery points to change the casting time to a bonus action for this casting. If you could have, if Tensor's Transformation was a sorcerer spell, this would have been so much better because you could meta magic, make this a bonus action spell, and then and a lay siege it, with your bow on the enemy. Like you. Just on site, you can start attacking on site. If we input multi classic, it becomes even more powerful. This spell, because this is the other spell. This is the other class I want to show you. Warlock. At eleventh level, warlocks have Mystic Arcana, and the Hexblade Warlock over here has an ability which lets them. Um, hold on, finding it over here over here it basically says the hexblade warrior can choose one weapon the hexblade warlock can choose one weapon and make it use charisma for attack rolls and damage 
So if they had tensor transformation, also warlocks naturally have proficiency in light and medium armors, while hex blades do anyway. And normal warlocks have light armor proficiency. So if warlocks got this spell, this would have been really good. Like just imagine your hex blade in medium armor, holding their great sword, or ready to face off against the boss. They cast test Tetsar's transformation and, and get ready. The boss tries to attack them, but again, because they are already wearing medium armor, they have really good uh, defenses. And then and they are able to strike back with a lot of damage. With 2d6 plus has 2d12 damage or or even 3d12 damage if they were if they went the big axe route 3d12 damage and and because it says you can't cast spells but hexblade warlocks get hexblade scars which increases damage and and gives you a higher crit chance you can but because this isn't a spell you can use this with tensor transformation like assuming you got it somehow that's the big issue got it somehow so uh, both the sorcerer and the warlock in their own way can make this spell work and work scarily well the my gripe with this spell is that the only class that gets it is the only class that can't use it why why give this spell to the wizard why not give this to the sorcerer or the warlock or hell um, give the paladin an ability to cast it or something can you imagine a paladin with tensor transformation put on it hell if you made it so that it was touch range instead of self range the wizard could have cast it on the fighter and made the fighter truly a terrifying force of nature something that can kill god and win why why was this it feels like this spell they made a really really cool spell and then gave it conditions which makes it borderline unusable if i ever play again if i ever play in a level 20 or epic level game i've already played it once if i ever get the chance to do it again i am going to play as jasmine who is one of my characters and and i am going to try and ask the gm if i can maybe sacrifice make a few sacrifices take some weaknesses or whatever to get access to ten search transformation that's how i'm going to do it going forward but yeah, I think there is a way to do that. Hang on, I, I'm i getting distracted. No, it's in the Dungeon Master's Guide. Mm. Epic Boons. Boon of High Magic. Oh, you already have one. I'm going to ask my DM if I ever get a chance to play at an epic level game and we are allowed to take a few boons. I'm going to ask the DM, hey DM, I can I take the boon of high magic and instead of getting a ninth level spell slot or whatever, can I just get an extra uh, sixth level mystic arcanum? Of course, I'm not trying to pull, a, pull the wool over his eyes. I'm going to be upfront and tell them the reason because I want to cast tensor transformation with my hex sudden in character. Level 20 OP hex blade paladin. I want tensor transformation on that character. Can I use my boon of fortitude, sorry, boon of high magic to please get tensor transformation? That would be my question to the DM. I'm not sure if he would allow that or not. But whatever. 
My point is Tensor's transformation is an amazingly good spell for every single full caster other than wizard. The other full caster is bard and some bards can get it naturally and it's good on, over there by the way. They can get it through, I think the bard ability is called Mystical Secrets where they learn one spell from any other class spell list. So it's good on swords bards. No complaint there. It's really good on bards, but yeah. Uh, it was designed for the wizard. It's available only to the wizard outside of bards doing mystical secrets. And this is, this is a spell that sucks only when you use it on a wizard. Do not use this spell on a wizard. If you somehow, some way, figure out to either optimizing bullshit or or some loophole or some um, fiat, if you find some way to get access to this spell as a character that isn't a wizard, either as a warlock or a sorcerer or a fighter, uh, yeah, take this spell, take this spell because this spell is awesome. But only when homebrew is in play. And that brings us to True Strike. You know my complaints about Tessar's transformation, where this spell was written in such a way that under certain circumstances, it would be an amazing spell, but it was written so that normally those circumstances would never happen. Every situation where you would want to cast Tessar's transformation is not a situation that would happen outside of homebrew. Yet, True Strike is that, but on steroids. True Strike in 5e is not just a bad spell. It's not just the worst spell. It is a spell that looks like it was custom designed to be bad. Like then the competition on how we can make the most unusable spell in the game. And they won that competition with True Strike. Let me explain what this spell does. You point your finger at a target in range. Our defeat. Your magic grants you a brief insight into the target's defense. On your on your next turn, you gain advantage on your first attack roll against the target, provided that this spell hasn't ended. It's a cantrip, so you can spam it. But this is concentration. Let me tell you what this spell actually does. Actually, no, I'm going to link a very fun animation in the description by Z Bashio that explains what the fuck is wrong with this spell. Go watch it. It's fun. But I'm also going to explain it myself. Picture this. You're in combat. You cast True Strike on an enemy within 30 feet of you because, again, the range is 30 feet. You have to cast it within 30 feet of you. You cast it. It, you somehow manage to survive to next turn. Then you attack. You roll with advantage on this attack, which means you roll twice, take the highest, highest number. If you hit, you do damage. You know what else you could have done instead of this? You could have attacked twice. True Strike is not a bonus action cantrip. It's an action cantrip. Instead of casting to True Strike to make sure you attack once you roll twice for one attack for one damage you could have just attacked twice for twice the potential damage like if you let's say you're attacking with a long sword but if you catch two strike you get to roll 1d20 twice to hit the target and if it hits you did what you do 1d8 damage if you attack twice you get to roll 1d20 two times across two turns and if it hits once you do 1d8 damage if it hits twice you do 2d8 damage because you're making two attacks across two turns now there is some niche here first of all is sneak attack as a rogue you would actually benefit from sneak attack like having advantage more than just attacking twice Sometimes, in some scenarios, not all of them, because 
Because you get a sneak attack once per turn on your attacks if you have advantage on them. There are other ways to get sneak attack, but that is one of the ways. So really, if you are like a level three rogue, this can actually be useful for you because if you attack twice, let's say you're attacking with a short sword. I'm picking a short sword for easier damage comparison. Let's say you're attacking with a short sword and you don't have advantage and none of the other uh, requirements for sneak attack has been met. So you attack twice across two times with your rogue. At level three, you would do oh, 1d6 damage. Sorry, 2d6 damage because the short sword has 1d6 damage die. So two attacks, 2d6 damage across, potential damage across two times. If you cast two strike in the first turn and attack in the second turn, instead you will be doing 3d6 damage. And this will just keep increasing the higher level rogue you are because the extra damage comes from your sneak attack. If you get sneak attack at level three, you do extra 2d6 damage once per time. But this is not a good way to do it because let me explain to you why. Right fucking here. If you cast this spell as a rogue or as a wizard or as a fighter or as anyone, if you cast the spell, this is concentration and you can't do anything until your next turn starts. And remember, the range is 30 feet. You need to be within 30 feet of your enemy to cast the spell. I guess one thing you can, no, even then you can't do it because everyone has usually 30 feet of movement. You can't cast the spell and move back because if you do, you will probably hey, not, you will probably not but have the movement to get back into the melee. Hold on, can I check something real quick? Huh. Well, I guess one thing you can do is cast this spell as a rogue. I found, I did it, guys, I did it. I found the one niche use of this spell. And for dramatic effect, I'll save it uh, until I'm done ragging on the spell. So anyway, like I was saying, let's say you cast this spell. You need to be within 30 feet of the enemy because it has a range of 30 feet. And then when you cast the spell, it's the enemy's turn now. The enemy has 30 feet of movement. He can get straight up next to you, bonk you with his hammer. You lose concentration of this spell. Congratulations, you played yourself. You just wasted your entire time doing nothing. You're, you're not getting sneak attack. You, you're just wasting a time that way. You can lose concentration. That's one of the biggest issues of this spell. You can lose concentration and you're going to lose concentration because you're within 30 feet of the fucking enemy. There is no scenario in which this is useful. Because if you cast the spell, the enemy can just run up to you and bonk you. However, like I said, there is one, and I mean only one scenario where this spell has some niche use. One that I found out while talking about it in this video. Step one, be arcane trickster. Step two, have bow. Step three, hey, magically start the turn and within 30 feet of your target. Why magically? Because again, you didn't move there because if you did, you wouldn't be, the, you wouldn't be able to maintain that 30 feet is what I'm saying. If you moved on your turn, you started your turn through whatever convoluted bullshit. You started your turn already being 30 feet away from your enemy. You cast two strike. You move back, you bonus action, then dash back with cunning action. Shoot. Actually, I think it can work even without it. Action, move in 30 feet. It cast to strike, bonus action back. You are now 60 feet away from your enemy, if not more. Enemy can't reach you. You shoot them with your bow, with sneak attack, because if you have advantage due to true strike. 
that is the one scenario where this spell has some use. It does not say that the target has to be, it does not say that this spell ends if the target is ever farther than 30 feet away from you. So I guess you can just cast this spell and move back, especially if you're a rogue, because true strike, bonus action, dash, get out of there, shoot next time. But even that is jank and kind of useless. You want to know why? First of all, rogues, it's actually way easier to get sneak attack off than people think it is. Let's just check sneak attack. Beginning at first level, you know how to strike your foe, strike subtly and exploit a foe's distraction. Once per turn, you deal an extra 1d6 damage to one creature you hit with an attack if you have advantage on the attack roll. The attack must use a finesse or ranged weapon. You don't, you don't need advantage on the attack roll if another enemy of the target is within 5 feet of it. That enemy isn't incapacitated and you don't have disadvantage on the attack roll. D&D is a team game. There are other players. It is highly likely that whoever you wanted to attack as your, your long range rogue they would be fighting the barbarian or the fighter. Or maybe they would be trying to kill the wizard. Either way, your one of your friends are probably going to be within five feet of that enemy. You don't need true strike. You can just attack normally, get sneak attack. And then casting true strike becomes even more pointless because then you can get sneak attack on two turns across two attacks. But even that, let's say your DM is being an ass and say, oh, you have to have advantage or else you can't get sneak attack damage. If, by the way, DM, not my any of my DMs, by the way, uh, I have had nothing but great DMs. This isn't directed at any of you. If you're listening to this, any of you, I have only one DM. I really need, I really want to play in more games because I have not been a player in quite a while. I've only been DMing a sandbox game for one player because I specialize in single player games. Single player sandbox DNGs, that's my specialty. So, uh, DM, if you're listening to this, this is not directed at you. I'm directing this to all the shitty DMs that may want to do this. DMs, don't, don't force your rogue to be hiding or have advantage in order to get sneak attack damage off. It's just not, it's just not, not balanced, I don't think. Like, the sneak attack damage might seem like a lot, but the wizard can do a lot of shit. Magic is really powerful. Giving the rogue just some extra damage once per every time is not going to be the end of the world. Don't make the rogue useless in combat. Because if you do make getting sneak attack hard, your rogue is just a level one character shooting a more accurate level one character shooting people with their bow or stabbing people with their sword heard in combat and most of their abilities are just out of combat exclusives at that point if you make sneak attack hard to get it'll nerf rogues into the ground and make them useless in combat so don't do that but yeah if your DM does that, you can still get sneak attack off with true strike because you have advantage. But even now, you don't need to do that. When Tasha's came out, Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, that book, gave a lot of optional class features to a lot of different classes. One of them for the rogue is steady aim. At third level, as a bonus action, you give yourself advantage on your next attack roll on the current turn. You can use this bonus action only if you haven't moved during this turn. And after you use the bonus action, your speed is zero until the end of the current turn. So now, rogues don't need true strike to give themselves advantage. They don't need to be within 30 feet to give the enemies adva give themselves advantage. They can just do it if they haven't moved to that turn, which is a nice feature. I don't hate this feature. I like this feature. 
I'm not dragging on this feature. But what this implies, what this means, is that True Strike is truly the one D&D spell that has zero use case. If you're playing with Tasha's cordon of everything, if you if the optional class features are not allowed, then yeah, it has that one very niche use case. True Strike is a spell. I think even though I've now discovered the one niche situation where it can be useful somehow it's not really worth it at this point i think it's safe to say that true strike is the one dnd spell that just cannot be used everything about this spell is built so you can't use it you can't use it in cool builds you can't use it to get some benefit. This is the dead spell. It does nothing. It's It literally just does nothing. It does worse than nothing. Because if you attack twice, at least you're doing more damage. It feels like every component of this spell, from its range, to its action casting time, to its concentration and its duration everything about this spell is working together to make this spell as unusable as possible so i digress that is it that is for this video that is this video and yeah i just ranted about i just screamed about spells for one hour my throat is destroyed <laughs> don't worry i wasn't actually angry i just get excited i tend to scream a lot when i get excited i speak really loudly when excited and this gets me excited so i'm not actually pissed at this spell just mildly annoyed yeah i'm definitely mildly annoyed i'm not really pissed at any of these spells but I just find it interesting. Also, final tidbit about True Strike. Apparently, in earlier editions of D&D, it was a first level spell. And when you cast it, it gave you a plus 10 to attack roll. So basically, it's like, I want my next spell to hit and destroy that guy. I'm casting True Strike. And you better hope that I, I can... That you better hope that I can't reach you with my spell next turn. Because I'm going to hit you with it, Zulk's finger up the ass of death explosiveness. Zulk's Ant-Man expand inside Thanos attack roll spell. Zulk's testicular torsion spell. So yeah, that's one use case of old true strike. Where if you want to torture your enemy with a truly awful awful spell and wants to make and want to make sure that it hits you cast true strike to give you a plus 10 to your attack roll and then absolutely destroy them with your next powerful spell in 5e though this spell is useless this spell is worse than useless so guys that's it for this video if you like this video, be sure to leave a like, comment, and or subscribe. Dislike if you edited it. I'll heart your comment to let you know I've read them. So just because I hearted your comment doesn't mean I agree with it or endorse it. And I'm Zulka RS and I'll see you next time. I need some coffee.